I'm John McDonald, I'm our critic for the Sydney Morning Herald and we're at the Ramses and the Gold of the Pharaohs exhibition which is just starting at the Australian Museum. We're going to have a reasonably brisk walk through this exhibition all by ourselves. When you see it, there are going to be thousands of people. So it's best that you come prepared. Straight away we meet a colossal head of Ramses. He was the ultimate self-promoter. Most pharaohs before or after Ramses were much more localised. They had their particular scene of operation. But he, who reigned for so long, was able to spread his influence far and wide. He also lived in a time of extraordinary peace and prosperity. So that gave him the money and the time to think about doing these things. Obelisks were messages, really. They were public proclamations of the deeds of the pharaohs, which were written for all to see, put up in public places, usually success in some battle or some particular event that had to be commemorated, or indeed their undying love for the particular deities that they worshipped. And here we see Ramses towering over his enemies, and they are three separate enemies. One is a Nubian, one is a Syrian, one is a Libyan. He's got them all by the hair, and he's just about to smite them with his great axe. I've seen this show already in Paris, and I've got to say, the Australian Museum presentation is superior to what I saw at the Parc de la Villette. It's more spacious, it's gives you a, a greater sense of, of progression. The show in Paris was just felt a little bit dark and crowded. Mind you, there were a lot of people there and there'll be a lot of people in this show too. But I, I do feel like the Australian Museum have done a great job in just laying this out in a very sensible, rational way. And everybody's going to enjoy this or get something out of it. As we come down the great escalator, we arrive at a statue of Ramses' mummy. This is his mummy, Tuya. She's got the Izzy Miyake dress on with all those pleats. I mean, these are the sort of things that you look today and you see the way that pop stars get themselves glammed up for photos. The Egyptians were the original pop stars when it came to all the gear, all the jewelry and the hairdos. I love these little drawings. They're sketches. This is where the artists who were perpetually engaged in decorating and creating the tombs for the afterlife, for the pharaohs, for the aristocrats, for everybody, would do little sketches just to try and work out a few ideas. Sometimes they did things like cartoons or satirical works. Often they just designed something and tried it out. And they offer an amazingly intimate view. You actually see them loosely working out ideas on these bits of stone. I mean, this is astonishing. This is a piece of linen. And look at the state of preservation of this. This comes from the 19th dynasty. It's 3,000 years old. It's been in a tomb for time immemorial. It's a piece of linen that has been heavily gessoed so as to create a surface. And then on top of that, they've added this very delicate drawing. Turning around here, we have this rather spectacular display. The central piece is a really remarkable sarcophagus. It's a box which is an outer sarcophagus. Inside, there would have been uh, a number of more personalised coffins for the deceased. It looks spectacular, you think it must be some noble person. In fact, it's the coffin of Senegem. Senegem himself was a well-known artist who did a lot of the work for tombs, for pharaohs, and he has arranged his own coffin. You don't have to be a pharaoh to have a great coffin. You know, you have to be uh, a successful artisan because it's not these artists are not just wild bohemians or workers they were intellectuals they were educated people they knew the whole regimen of what you put on a coffin and what you don't put on a coffin how you do it how you address the gods and so on so this Senegem was an impressive character in his own right this room is full of fantastic things when you think of the thousands of things that have been excavated from tombs in Egypt and they are still making discoveries. They are finding things all the time. They are finding things which change their views of ancient Egypt, of their different practices, of their beliefs. We're talking about 3,000 years of history. Even though huge damage has been done, there's still a lot to find. This is a fantastic, the coffin and canopic coffinets of Sheshonk II, where they would take the organs out 
of the body and preserve them specially. And this kind of classic Egyptian bust, it's Meremptah. Meremptah was son number 13. He was the 13th crown prince under Ramses, and he's the one who finally ascended to the throne. This is one of the highlights of the exhibition. It's the sarcophagus of Meremptah. It's a huge hunk of granite, beautifully carved, and it's carved at both the top and the bottom. It's what we have here is a mirror, so you can actually look in and you can see the goddess, the long, thin body of the goddess stretched out beneath. These are tombs which are to show the greatest possible piety towards the afterlife and the deities. And so consequently, they're, they're masterpieces of, of art. This is a fantastic piece of carving. Okay, so this is the big spectacular grand finale of the show. Now this is the coffin in which we found Ramses' remains. But it's not the original coffin in which he was buried. The original coffin, which would have, would have it's, it's almost unimaginable what it must have been like. But he was taken out of that sarcophagus by the priest, more or less rescued, and then put into this much simpler coffin with his cartouche, identifying him as Ramses, and the little story of his journey there. So that in, in future, when people came upon that coffin, they would know this was Ramses the Great. It's a much simpler coffin than what he would have been in, but it's still a really exquisite thing. It's a beautiful piece of carving. It's a piece of cedar wood, which is always, always fantastic in itself. Ramses had the ability to decide, all right, I've done my war thing, I've been the warrior, I've got that reputation, but now the most important thing is peace and prosperity. And that long, long period of peace and prosperity was what enabled Ramses to bring Egypt to the heights that it reached under him. It enabled it to be an era of, well, they call it a golden age under Ramses, and that's exactly what they had. They were never so wealthy or so well off or things so peaceful as they were, and it enabled him also to build monuments, to concentrate on creating cities, works of art, temples, artifacts. It, it was a testimony for all time that in order to achieve anything, you've got to be able to agree, you've got to have peace. It's a testimony that we are very hard of learning today.